Hi, and welcome back. In the last part, we looked at the user interface. More specifically, I explained the main form in detail and how it was hooked up to the HTML design that we created with Bootstrap. If you skipped it, you might have a look at that first because this part definitely builds on it. I also mentioned at the end of the last part that we are going to replace the FNC controls, which handle the maps from FNC maps right here. And we're using as a service, this is something I have not shown in the last video, the service is set to leaflet. This does not require us to have an API key, just as for example, open layers would not require us to have an API key. So switching it to leaflet is possibly the best option right now for this client because we don't need an API key and I can share this demo with you. So the only thing you need to add is on the back end when it comes to API keys. However, I'm going to leave it with FNC maps. And the reason for that is if I show you the advantages of FNC maps first, and then we migrate it over to the default component that is bundled with TMS Web Core, you can make the decision yourself if it is worth into using FNC maps on the client side, or if you want to stay with the standard component. I think that makes sense. This is, this is how my tutorial process works. Like when I record one episode, I sit down and think about the next part again in more detail. Of course, I have a rough scratch how everything will work out. But this time I made the decision to not follow along and change it right away, but to show you the example as it is here right now. And then when I've done that, I'm going to go into Git Kraken and switch over to the leaflet branch where I replaced everything with the leaflet component that is bundled with TMS Web Core now. At this point, if we start the application with the design of the main form, and this is something that might happen to you. This is Delphi 12 specific. You can keep on clicking on the run button as much as you want. The whole toolbar more or less doesn't work anymore. So you can either also the menu doesn't work, but what does work is you click on the designer first. And then if you click control shift F9, then you can compile your project and then you should get the use of the toolbar and of the menu back. This is something that happened to me a couple of times with Delphi 12. It hasn't happened in previous versions. So you see with control shift F9, I can compile and run the application. And now if I go back to Delphi, the menus work again. So I don't know what this is. So if you recompile your project using the shortcuts, you basically make Delphi work again. The other only options, if that would happen, that you can't use the menu anymore or the user interface goes dead on you, so to speak, was to kill the process, of course. But that's not necessary in this case. You can literally just keep everything as is. Just press Control Shift F9 to compile and run the project, and you're back in business. So this is the design that we have so far with the origin and the destination and our map in the middle. And notice that the map is nicely moving in the area that we defined it for. I forgot one essential part. I explained it, but I didn't point it out explicitly. So I want to do that now because the map here, it at first it seems like very, very easy to do. Like you define a rectangular environment with a div and that's it. Well, the tricky part is that the div needs a height. If the div doesn't have a height, the map will not appear. Let me show you real quick. This is this is worth showing because you might run into this with another component and wonder why you don't see anything. So we go to the HTML. And if you look at it here, we have style, height, 400 pixels. And that's how I define the height of the map. Let's take that out. Save it and run it again. See, now the toolbar is working fine again. This is definitely something that came up in Delphi 12, and I'm sure Embarcadero will fix it quickly. And now 
what do we see? Nothing. And if we look at the HTML, that's how I find out about it, and go into the elements over here, and then look, we can see that we do have the table, and here we also have our map right here. But and, and the component from TMS Web Core is being rendered. The FNC map is here, but you can't see it because here height is initialized with zero. So if we set this to 500, there you go. That's how it works. So you have a couple of opportunities to make these changes. Either you do it in the HTML, like I did it. I basically added a style tag to the div. Another opportunity might be that you force this in the component, but that doesn't work because you see here the height is set to 400. That does not force the component to be drawn 500 pixels high. That does not work because it is hosted on this div. And if we look at the div, I have to show the structure view again. The div map here, we also say that the height is 400. That's how I thought I could basically force it. So let's, or 100%. So let's set the height to absolute 400. I don't change the HTML. Let's see if that works. Again, the div does not suffice to, to override this. So the only option you have is a solution that I figured out to basically add a style tag right here, recompile, and then you're ready to go. So that's why I point this out so vehemently again, because it took me quite some time to figure this out. And I have a syntax error in my HTML, I think. Let's see here, yes, semicolon. And this is how the HTML should look. And let's run it again. So that is something essential when embedding FNC components That's that way. They might not have a height. So in order to get the height like this, you need to set it in the div component that hosts the FNC control. Very, very important. And the only way to figure it out basically is in this case to try all the options that we have. Try the component first. If the component doesn't work, try the component that owns the component. If that doesn't work, define it in HTML and you'll find a way. We're finally ready to go over to the data. Like, how is the data being transmitted from the server, from our backend, to the client? So we start the backend again. I pointed this out the last time. The backend has to be running. Otherwise, we can't access anything. Also, what is very, very important and is, I would say, looking at the questions that I get for my XData course, the number one question is this. If we go to the server container, look at the server, double click on the XData server component, make sure that the course middleware is part of the server because it doesn't have to have any settings here. And this opens up your server from everywhere. I definitely would advise you to add origin, your domain name, so that not everybody can access your server. However, if you don't have this course middleware enabled, the request from the web application will fail. And that's the number one question for my X data course. Like, why does my server fail? And that is the number one reason why it fails. So double clicking on the web project again, closing the structure view, we don't need that. We can now look at the final implementation, pressing F12. And what happens is, of course, we call our backend. So clicking get directions, we should see the call to the backend. This is what happens right here. So we let's stop this. So the driving directions, JSON is being returned. That's the result of our request. And if we look at the headers, this is where the request goes. It goes to my web service right here with a post request. And the parameters, of course, are in the payload right here. This is the payload that we defined. Destination right here and origin. So how do we implement that in TMS Web Core to call our backend? Let's look at the data types we use first, because 
right in the beginning of this tutorial, I said we're going to use different source files for the client and for the server to show that it is not a requirement because yet again, developers sometimes think if you write your X data server, that you have to be able to incorporate the Pascal definition some, of some sort into your client project, even if it's like written in Swift or C sharp. And that is a major struggle. Like, how can we make that work? They look for a download, for example, the Swift library for X data or the C sharp library for X data. You don't need any of that. You just need to define the same data structures in the language that you use. And in this case, we're using object Pascal again, or Delphi again. So we can make a definition that matches the JSON that is being sent by the backend. So in this case, we're using a custom definition to retrieve the information. And yet again, we have the coordinate, T coordinate. There's not much change here. We have the latitude and the longitude. However, I added this. I added a property that I can read it as a coordinate rec. So what happens here is if you look at get coordinate rec, we create a coordinate with the latitude and longitude based on the properties of the um, of the class or of the object. And create coordinate is something from TMS FNC maps. It creates a coordinate for our latitude and longitude in a data format that is used by TMS FNC maps. And the data type is TTMS FNC maps coordinate rec. So instead of doing the conversion and everything ourselves manually, we simply define that as part of our class, of our data class. Okay, that doesn't stand in the way of our retrieval of the values when we receive them from the web service, because on the TMS web course side, we can't use a deserialization mechanism. We won't automate it. We literally go through the JSON step by step. I'd show you that precise process step by step. In addition to one coordinate, of course, we need multiple coordinates, T coordinates, which is an object list. This is less significant here in TMS web core. However, we reserve the list and the items on the list are being freed automatically by default. T step is an instruction on a route, very, very similar to the, to the server. However, also here, we, in addition to the actual list of coordinates, we also prepare the data in the FNC maps data type, which is a TTMS FNC maps coordinate record array. This is also a helper that allows us to retrieve all the coordinates that are stored inside of the coordinates list as a record array using create coordinate multiple times with an iteration so that we have an array of all the coordinates that are described in that step and that we can feed. I know that TMS FNC maps allows us to draw polylines on a map with that data type. That's why I create that data type in our class. So I don't have to do that in the code when I display things on the map. Instead, I put it where it belongs. It belongs to the step. It doesn't belong to the to the view, so to speak, that draws the coordinate on the map. Instead, I embed it or make it part of the actual step. The properties themselves are the same as on the client, and they have to be, because otherwise I would lose information. This is also something that you could decide to do, that you do not read everything that the JSON has to offer, and thus make your classes a little bit slimmer on the client than the amount of information that the server delivers. Of course, as we discussed before, you might provide a different endpoint if you also implement the server yourself. In order to access the web service, I added a data module to the application. And so we have the main form here, which is a T web form, which is of class T form directions. But if you go to the source code, you can see that it's a web form. And then we have the service manager, as I called it, which looks like a data module. It actually is a data model. However, it is a T web data module. And you create those by right clicking 
inside of the project manager and then picking create a new TMS web module. I don't know how many times it happens to me that I simply go here and then create here on the database, I create a data module. That won't work because that derives from a VCR class and not from T-Web data module. Also a common mistake I get asked about when developers read my TMS web core book and try to write their own service manager and are like, the compiler says like this class can't be found. Yes, certainly the class can't be found. It has to be a T-Web data module. So easiest way to add them to your project, right click, on the project and then here in the context menu, create a new TMS web module. In this module, I define a field variable that will take or store the root that has been retrieved. So if you were thinking about providing multiple roots in the future, this is where you would have to make a modification to have a list or an array of different roots. And then a private method which is used to process the driving directions that are being retrieved from the web service. And the data type is JS value. JS value is the most unspecific data type of a JSON document. So a JS value can be anything. And then you have like string, a number, or you have an object, or you have an array. These are the different data types that you have in the object structure or class structure, I apologize, of the class structure of the JSON uh, document. And thus, in order to be unspecific, you use JS value. And then the actual method right here that requests the root with an origin and a destination from the web service. And this method is marked with async. That means we're going to use the great functionality from TMS Web Core that we can use the keyword, as I refer to it, like formally it is a function, but it is like a keyword in other languages like Swift, C-sharp, they have the await keyword. So I always stumble and call it a keyword as well, but await is a means so we don't have to use a callback or an event. Instead, we can wait for an asynchronous method to complete and then continue the execution of the method. You'll see that. But for that to be allowed, you need to use the custom attribute async with your method. And finally, we are going to publish the root here, the private variable, the private field variable, I should say. We are going to publish that so it can be accessed from the outside using the root property. And in addition, we also need a data structure for the data that is being sent to the web service, right? It has to be in a specific form. The form is determined by the data type that we use. So let's go to the developer console first because this makes it very clear, I think. So the post request right here to our endpoint, post here to this URL right here, this is the URL that is being constructed automatically by Xdata, usually, or we can also just call it because we know what the endpoint is going to be. I'm going to show that in detail as well. But if you were to use the Xdata components that are also part of TMS Web Core, this URL would also be constructed for you. In this case, we're not going to use any Xdata components. I'm going to show you the really, really generic approach to these things. The key is the content type is we are asking for is application JSON. We want to reply as JSON, but it's a post request and a post request also has a payload. And the payload is right here. And it's the body of your request. And it is also in JSON format. And here you can see the um, destination and origin encoded in a data type. And this data type is right here. If we go back to Delphi, this is what we'll use in order to create the JSON. And why do, how do we know what the JSON has to look like? Well, we have multiple opportunities to look this up. For example, we go to the server, go to the Swagger UI, and then we expand this right here. And here we see the body property 
has to have this structure, JSON structure, an origin property, destination property with two strings. And how do we know that this is, or how did we influence that? Well, we have to go back to the declaration of our service, going back to xdata. We go to services, we go to the direction service dot pass. And then right here, we said driving directions, origin, destination, string. And because it's a post, the post is implicit because if you don't specify anything in xdata, it's an HTT post. That means it's being put in the body and looking at the xdata documentation, we know that this means it will be one object with an origin property and a destination property. So that's how you can follow along how these things all come together. Let's look at the request root method, how we access or how we send the data to the web service and ask for the root. The component on the data module right here is a normal, well, normal <laughs> T web HTTP request. Why do I say normal? Because the alternative would always be that you use the TX data web connection and the TX data web client. That would give you the advantage that you don't have to look at the URL or have to create the URL. Instead, you would stay in the terminology of services. The downside is that you have to establish a connection first and then the xdata components would be able to read the model of your xdata server and then you would not have to specify a url instead you would have to specify the name of the service that you want going to call in this case i'm going to do what you would do from any other client for example if you were to write a c-sharp client you wouldn't have any xdata components right so you would have to make the call manually which you can easily do you construct the URL yourself, as you can see here. So this is my um, proxy, but the end is the interesting part. You're gonna say slash direction service slash driving directions to the base URL. So if you were testing on your local host, you could make this HTTP localhost colon port and then direction service driving directions. The path, of course, is also built depending how you built your service definition. So right here you see I direction service. So this is the first part of it. And then this is the second part slash driving directions. Of course, xdata is a very, very comfortable, flexible framework. You can define your own path. But that, once again, my books and the xdata course give you more information how you can change the default settings of this. This is just using the defaults, direction service slash driving directions. And again, Swagger tells you exactly that. It tells you here, in this case, HTTP localhost port 2001 slash direction service slash driving directions. That's how you can access everything. And then it tells you also the reply how the reply looks, what is the data structure of the reply. As an aside here, the reply, of course, does not tell you if you have an integer or a floating point, double number, because in JSON, there is no distinction between integers and floating points. So everything is just a zero. And if you define it in Delphi as an integer and then you have a floating point number, you might run into issues and have to do proper error handling. So that is something to consider that you need to communicate. Is it a floating point value or is it just an integer value if you use integer in your Delphi class? After dropping the TWeb HTTP request on the data module, you have to set its properties. The first thing you have to flip is the command. You have to set that to HTTP post because as we've just seen, we need a post request. And then the response type has to be set to RTJSON because we want to be able to navigate the JSON document when the result is being returned. And the URL, you have to set that accordingly to where your XData server is running. With that in mind, we can implement the request root method. 
of course, remember it's marked as async. And then we can create the payload. And how do I create the payload? So I call T driving directions post data create. That's a class and I pass in there origin and destination. So let's look at this constructor. I call the base class and I simply say self origin is a origin and self destination is a destination. That's all I do. And going back from where we came, I then say L body string is T TMS FNC object persistence safe object to string. That is a feature of TMS FNC core, which is all which all FNC based frameworks are using as a foundation. And as we're using TMS FNC maps right now on the client, I have FNC core available. So why not use it, right? And the method safe object to string converts our object into a string and to be more precise into a JSON string. There is no mention that it is JSON here in the class, but TTMS FNC object persistence is built for JSON persistence or serialization and deserialization. And thus safe object to string will yield a JSON string. And that is what we can assign to the post data of the client. We also clear the header and then set the content type to application JSON. The headers property is actually a string list, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, this is very different from Sparkle or TMS X data, where you have a different data type. So you can literally say add, and then you have a key value pair. In this case, you specify the key value pair with the um, equal sign. So on the left side, we have the content type, and on the right side, we have the application JSON. This is essential. Otherwise, Xdata is going to say, I don't know what kind of data type you're requesting. So you might get a 400 error of some kind. At this point, we're ready to perform or execute the request. I think execute was taken. So there needed to be another method name for the asynchronous variant with await. So perform was picked. So client.perform, the client is going to perform for us, right? is getting called and the data type that is being returned. And that is the tricky part. And that is something you can just get from the documentation, because even if you look at the source code, most of the time, you're just going to find TJ as promise, as you see right there. And if you go into the source code, remember, don't go into the source code here using the VCL kind of approach or the IDE approach, I should say, because this gives you just a wrapper class and not the actual class that is being compiled. Because if you look at TMS Web Core, there is the core source and the library source. And the only chance we have is we can look for the actual file. So you go here. So you know this is the weblib rest unit. So at this point, weblib.rest. And we have here a couple of them. So this is the one that is being used by the IDE, the component library source. And here we have the core source. And that's the one that is being used by the TMS Web Core compiler. And very important, I would not recommend basically dragging it into the IDE because sometimes the code editor gets a little bit finicky. So I right click and say edit with Notepad++, much better. And then if you go to perform, there you see async perform, and it's most likely the THTTP request. This is literally what we're looking at. And there we get like the TJS promise that is being returned. But here you see that on success, we would return the request, and the request is of TJS xml http request that's how you can find out the actual return type what is coming back and we see here that execute is being used for the callback or event call so perform was picked as an alternative to have something that allows us to use await instead of using a callback or an event so going back at the source code closing this so this line here waits for the result 
to be returned and it will be stored in L rec. That's the variable right here. So this actually will basically suspend the thread for a little bit and then go back at some point as soon as the answer is being retrieved. So there's no need to implement an event. There's no need to implement a callback. You can literally do it from here to here. However, in between here, like this position right here, there might be a certain amount of time before the next line is being executed. Okay, so just pointing this out. And of course, there might be other events triggered in your user interface, you know, because this particular part is just being suspended. That doesn't mean your whole application is blocked. That's very important to point out. So when it's returned in LREC, we can read the status. And if it's 200, 200, that means the HTTP response is 200. And if we look again at the developer console right here, we also have here, there is the 200. That's what xdata sends back, 200, okay. If it is not 200, there has been an error. And then you could do your error checking right here. We could just log it to the console. There's many, many, many opportunities. You can also basically implement events into your data module that then interact with the user interface to present an error message. But that would be breaching the scope of this tutorial. At this point, you can call process driving directions with the response and response, surprise, surprise, if you go here, is of type JS value. That's our root of our JSON document. So at this point, we have this response right here. And this, all of this is a JS value. Don't get this wrong, you know? So the first thing you need to do is we need to cast this to a data type. And the data type, of course, is T root. This is a root that's being returned. How do I know this? Well, I know the service definition, right? Or I know the swagger definition. Go in here. We see this is the object. And going at our Delphi, at our service definition, U direction service right here, we have T root. And T root inside of our server is defined as scrolling down here like this, T root has the property steps. So this is what I would expect, right? So going over here, looking at the actual result, surprise, surprise, there are steps, and this is the result of our web service. So it all comes together really, really nice. The problem is if you build these things from scratch for the first time, it can be quite overwhelming. This is why I show you these examples as a whole, that you see the whole process. We started building the server. We started with the data types. The data types are being filled, returned, and now we're building the client that reads these things in your web application. Believe me, you have to do this multiple times before it goes over into your blood flow like writing a VCL application. This is not something that will come easily. You will learn it by repetition, repetition, repetition. Simple as that, like with any other programming language, how you learn it. So as we know this is a T root, we can now process the result. And this is exactly what we do in the, let me close everything right here from the server side so we don't get confused. In the server manager, we look at the process driving directions. So the response is being returned. And now the worst thing is error inside in the IDE. I don't know why it never gets it right. This is uh, something that is really, really annoying, but the Delphi error inside will mark everything as an error. But if you compile it, it's just fine. And the reason for that is, the, the, as you can see in the bottom, left corner, we use the pass to JS compiler, not the Embarcadero Delphi compiler to create our web application. And the source that is used for the VCL is not able to clarify for error insight that this is a valid line. So you will end up with a lot of lines being marked with errors like you can see here. However, be assured, rest assured, I know what I'm doing here. The same goes for the FNC stuff. Everything is being marked with an error because the IDE simply doesn't get 
how the code looks and it can't actually with some of the parts because they are hidden by these wrapper classes. So that is something that makes the job a little bit more difficult when writing code inside of the IDE. However, code completion is still available, but for whatever reason, error insight still marks it as wrong. That is something you have to accept and learn to ignore, so to speak. You could also say, well, then I'll switch it off when I'm working with TMS Web Core projects, I'll simply switch error insight off. I have just learned it is still helpful to have enabled, but in this case, whenever I parse JSON, I've learned to ignore it. In order to process the driving directions, we start by freeing the root that is stored right now, and we create a new one. That's safe because after initialization, it's nil. And we also free it when the data module is being destroyed. But here we free it again and immediately create a new instance. And then we always have two kinds of instances. One is the JS object right here. And the other one is the class, our Delphi class. So this TJS object, see it as a JavaScript object. That's what JS literally says. And that's the representation of the JSON document. It sounds complicated at first, but if you go through it step by step, it makes perfect sense. So what we do here is we get the response, which of JS value, and we convert it to a TJS object. That allows us, if we look at right here, this is the object, opening brace, and then at the very bottom, it's a long object, I can't scroll to the bottom, we can access these properties now. So I can access the steps property of that object. And that's what I'm going to do. I go here and say L root object is of type TJS object. And then I can access the steps property of that object. And this is the only thing that is a little bit tricky because this is a string. Of course, if you have a typo, your application will crash. So what you could add to your classes is is something like a dictionary, like Aurelius uses it. So you could use something like troot dot steps name, for example. And then you go to your service types, go to your troot, and then here under public, you say proper, um, you say class function, and you say root steps, for example, okay, or steps, uh, property name, prop name, like this. And then you activate code, and then you say result is steps. And that way, of course, this has to be typed correctly. However, whenever you use it in your application, you can simply say here, troot dot steps prop name, and then you have type safety again, because you're not using a string. I, in this kind of case, for an example, that overcomplicates things, right? I think you agree with that on me. So let me change it back to what it was before. But the argument that, oh, how are you using strings again? That is not better than writing JavaScript code. I disagree. You can, if you use some of Delphi's or object Pascal's language features, you can make it uh, okay again. So right now we have here a semicolon missing. Da, 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 da. Right here. It's always good to clean up your code when you're while you're explaining. Okay, code is compiling again. So at this point, we access the array. So L steps array is a TJS array. That's a JavaScript type of the array. And that is typecast from the steps, because if we look at the JSON document, these steps here, square brackets, that's an array. So an array of steps. And inside there, we have objects, one object, another object, and so on. So we, we unwrap the onion, so to speak. So now we can iterate all the steps by using a, a loop, a for loop, and we use i and j. i is the outer loop, j is going to be the inner loop. And because 
pass to JS doesn't have inline variables, we have to declare those here. Instead of nicely writing for var i, we have to declare it up here, which makes it less readable. So we go with 0 to l steps array dot length. We could also write length opening brackets l steps array. No, you couldn't because this is not an array type. This is a TJS array. So it is really required for us to write TJS array and then use the typecast with steps. And then we iterate all the different elements from zero to the length of the array minus one, of course, because we start at zero and the length would be one too much. So we subtract one. And then we create an L step object, which once again is of TJS object. This gives us access to each of the properties of this. So we have access to distance, durations, and instructions, and of course to the list of coordinates, which themselves are of type T coordinate. So from there we can say L step object is the, L the element number I. And then again, for the coordinates, we have another TJS array. So we have an L coordinate array, we cast it to TJS array. And then we look at the step first, we create a T step, which is our Delphi object. And then we transfer the values from the object from the L step object right here, distance, duration, and instructions by also casting them to the proper type js dot to integer and js dot to string. It's a helper function of TMS Web Core, and then assign it to instructions, durations, and distance of L step. And finally, we need to read the coordinates. We already have the coordinate array, and the same approach as with the outer loop for the steps. We do the inner loop for the coordinates. We take the length minus one, create a coordinate object derived of t coordinate and then we read to a number because it's a floating point right so latitude and longitude is a double so there isn't even to integer to float to a number to number is and this this is the the crazy thing in javascript because javascript is not really strictly typed right so everything is a js, JS value you know js value can literally be anything so there you have the latitude js to number for the latitude property and longitude for the longitude property. And finally, we need to add it to the list of coordinates of our L step object. And of course, after reading all the values for L step, we have to add the step to the actual root f root steps dot add L step. Yes, it's a lot to unwrap, but it becomes easier and easier the more you do it. And hopefully, uh, we're already, I can say this, I'm already working with TMS in conjunction. We're looking at different solutions, different approaches to make this easier. So far, this is still in the early stages, but I'm quite certain that in the future, you will see some definite improvement for these things. So going from there, you have F root filled with all the information of the JSON document. And at that point, if this is executed right here, because process driving directions is executed, you're done. And, and the key thing is that a request root is also marked as async. So looking at our user interface now, how does the user interface call this? We look at the implementation of the button. The button calls get directions. And get directions, if we go up, is also marked as async because we want to be able to use await in get directions as well. So we wait for request root of the service manager to be executed. And this is possible because request root inside of our service manager is marked as async. So going here back. To this, we can say await f service manager request root origin destination. Where do these come from? Well, I defined those, I think, as properties. Correct. So origin and destination are defined as properties. And if we look at get origin, we have txt origin dot text, and for destination is txt destination dot text. So here get origin and 
get destination txt destination dot text. So this code is very readable because I added a couple of properties. And if you wonder why there isn't a return type, it's not necessary. This there's you can simply specify a wait with a method that you want to wait for because there is no return value, right? It just request the root. And the nice thing is that if request root is being executed or has been executed, we know that f root might be assigned, right? F root might have a value because at the end of request root, we call process driving directions and process direct driving directions assigns f root. So at that point, all the information that has been retrieved from the web service is stored in if we access it from here, f service manager dot root right there. That's where our root is going to be. And because we used await, we know that as if as soon as we call update table, the value is there. If this await would be missing, update table would be called before the result has been received from the web service. So this await is essential. Otherwise, you call it too early. That's very, very important to point out. So the final step is to present the information from F root that is stored in F service manager on the user interface right here. We have to generate the table and that's precisely what we're going to do in the next video.